So I start the presentation with just kind of relay a quick story. I used the lunch break as an opportunity to call home, check on my kids, make sure that they made it to school with their lunches today since dad wasn't home to pack it. Um, and I have a boy and a girl, and my boy and girl just see the world very differently from each other, as you might expect boys and girls do. Uh, we live in a neighborhood that has a bunch of small lakes. Those lakes um, you know, have fish in them, so we often uh, go fishing in the afternoon. When my kids were little, um, you know, my boy would do kind of boy things. He, he loves to fish. He'd take the fishing rod and he'd wave it around and pretend it was a lightsaber or a sword. He just kind of, you know, did typical boy kind of things. And it was one day I was, um, you know, fishing with my daughter and she picked up, you know, a bunch of grass and I know she was throwing it into the lake. And then I saw her and she was taking the fishing rod and stirring it in the water. And I'm like, Abby, what are you doing? She's like, Dad, I'm making a recipe. So boys and girls, my, my kids just see the world very differently um, as I was getting stories from home of uh, th this morning, just reminded of those, con uh, those um, constant differences. And part of my talk here today, I'm gonna talk about some of the differences that, uh, from stat static assessors and, and dynamic assessors and how, they, and how they see the world. So a quick, uh, quick agenda for this session, I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, then I'll give uh, some background and observations that kind of led to this talk. Then I'll talk about um, some ways that dynamic web assessors uh, can use various static techniques in their assessments and show off a little tool that a colleague and my colleague and myself uh, developed and then give you a couple, a couple takeaways. So quick introduction, I'm Greg Patton. I'm the mobile delivery manager for HP Fortify On Demand. Um, as part of the HP Fortify On Demand team, we are a cloud-based uh, security assessment service. We do uh, assessments of static assessments of source code analysis. We also do web and mobile runtime assessments. And you know, in my security career over the last you know, seven, eight years, I've you know, primarily been involved in dynamic testing. So a lot of my talk today will uh, be from the perspective of a dynamic, uh, dynamic web tester. And in preparing for this uh, talk, I did uh, some quick research. I hit the Wayback Machine and determined that I attended my first OWASP meeting way back in June of 2007. And that was the, uh, uh, it's actually the Houston chapter's very first meeting. So I've been involved in OWASP for a number of years and I'm thrilled to be here with you guys here today. So some quick background and observations. Um, I snapped this picture a month ago at, uh, at Black Hat I was talking to Waspy, and I love this picture because it looks like, at first glance, you might think that Waspy's been um, out in Vegas partying too hard. Um, he's leaning up against the wall, and you can see his hand has fallen off. Uh, but that's not the case. I was actually talking to Waspy about some of my observations um, as a dynamic web tester and some of the, some of the things that, that I see uh, that, are, that are missed a lot in dynamic assessments. And Waspy just uh, fell against the wall. Um, he's, he's just kind of floored that, you know, even after... Uh, all these years, we're still missing a lot of the same things and still making a lot of the same types of mistakes. So I talked a little bit about, uh, about uh, the differences between my boy and girl. Um, I, I see that we have a lot of divides within our industry. We have the kind of classic security versus usability um, battles. I think we've all had these discussions before. I think uh, you know, complex passwords are kind of the common you know, security versus us usability battle. The security folks are you know, try, try to Im implement a password policy that's extremely complex, a 128 character password that must have, you know, mixed case, uppercase, lowercase, special characters. Oh, and you need an auth token as well, with, uh, another special code that you have to enter. And then the business, side is, uh, the business side says, yeah, that's really nice. We're interested in security. Uh, but what we really want is just, you know, we can enter uh, yeah, a simple passcode that our users can enter. We'll just do one, two, three, four and, and hit OK. We you know, constantly have this security versus usability battle. Um, and here at this conference, we have a builders versus breakers track. Uh, this is obviously the breaker session. We're gonna talk about breaking uh, web applications. Um, we, we still have this divide between builders and breakers and we're, we, this, this common separation. And the divide that I'm gonna concentrate on here today is that divide between uh, static and dynamic, both uh, the assessors that run static and dynamic tests and, and the folks that uh, uh, initiate static and dynamic tests. I think we, we see the world a little bit differently. And both sides try to argue that um, you know, it's static is better or dynamic is better. Um, when, when really, we, uh, 
th there are you know, pros and cons to both, both, uh, both approaches. You know, on the static side, the static folks will tell you that we're looking at the source code. We've got kind of a true, uh, we, we can see the, the, the full application. We know exactly what's happening. We can do um, deep dive into your data flow analysis. We can pinpoint exactly where your vulnerabilities are, uh, give you back stack trace information, give you back a line of code of exactly what you need to fix. Uh, and the dynamic guys will say, well, that's really nice, but um, you, you guys tend to over-report vulnerabilities. You report a lot of vulnerabilities that um, aren't necessarily exploitable when we execute the application at runtime. Um, a lot of things that the, uh, the web server or other ways that the application was deployed, you know, might, uh, there might be other compensating controls that, uh, that, that negate a lot of your findings. So, you know, dynamic's better because we get kind of a true picture of the application at runtime. Um, we can see how the application was deployed. And static guys will fire back that, um, yeah, you'll, you'll see how the application was deployed, but if you deploy the application a little bit differently, if you modify uh, different web server uh, uh, configurations, you know, a lot of those vulnerabilities that you were d dismissing before come back into play. So we have this kind of constant back and forth. Um, another back and forth that we often see is, um, you know, static assessments are very good at finding technical vulnerabilities. They obviously have the source code, they can find that technical stuff really well, but they don't necessarily find the logical vulnerabilities that a lot of uh, dynamic runtime assessors find, um, a lot of the uh, logical flaws. Uh, a great example of a logical flaw um, is a kind of the classic shopping cart uh, application where you have kind of three steps to complete a, a uh, payment uh, transaction where step one, add items to your cart, step two, um, enter your payment information, then step three, uh, enter your sh shipping information and complete the, uh, complete the transaction. You know, uh, oftentimes we find logical flaws that will uh, enable users to bypass one of those steps. Say so you can step right from step one to step three without executing step two. You often find you know, static tools don't necessarily um, find those logical flaws um, that you know, runtime uh, dynamic testers can find. So as a, uh, pr primarily as a uh, web tester, um, I, I see several challenges. Um, and one of the challenges that I, I commonly see that uh, our companies don't often run static and dynamic assessments in concert. So we find some people run static, some people run um, dynamic, some, some people actually run both, they, they won't run both at the same time. So we very rarely uh, see people uh, that execute security assessments that take into account both static source code and runtime analysis at the same time where one team, uh, or one group of testers has that kind of 360 degree view of all that's happening with the application. Um, some folks uh, do build in um, static and dynamic testing into their SDLC. We see uh, a lot of times folks will run uh, static um, assessments while they're developing their application. The developers will go through a couple iterations and they'll throw the code over for uh, source code analysis. They'll get those results back, implement some changes, go through a few more iterations, uh, and, and then throw things back in for more static uh, source code uh, analysis. Uh, and then maybe at the end of their project when they're all done, they pass it off to the deployment team and the deployment team will run uh, a dynamic assessment. But the dynamic assessors kind of tend to very rarely get the, uh, the benefits of seeing the results of all those previous um, uh, static findings. So we t tend to com compart compartmentalize these, uh, these types of security assessments. We just find that very few people run static and dynamic together where there's one testing group looking at it all. Uh, another challenge I see is uh, the uh, dynamic uh, testing tools are still missing a lot of things on the client side, uh, specifically a lot of uh, JavaScript and DOM-based uh, vulnerabilities. I think our uh, dynamic scanners have gotten a, a whole lot better over the last seven years, but we're still just missing a whole lot. Uh, you know, with WebInspect, Akinetics, the other products as well have more deep dive analysis into JavaScript, but, they, they, but they're still missing a lot of uh, DOM-based elements. And all that client-side data is often um, information that dynamic testers are, are, will, will often kind of gloss over as they, uh, as they target a, a lot of the back-end operations. And a third challenge I have as a dynamic tester is I very rarely get um, source code to analyze. And kind of the common phrase, you've all probably heard it at one point or another, um, well, you know, um, th there's, the quote, well, there's no source code available. You know, maybe this is because the deployment team 
isn't, doesn't work as close with the application team or development team and, and they don't have the source code. Maybe it was developed by a third party and that uh, you know, third party doesn't want to release their, their source code. Uh, whatever the case, it seems that you know, dynamic testers very rarely, um, rarely receive source code for, for analyzing. And this is troubling because I, I talked to a lot of my, uh, my friends in the industry, a lot of uh, friends uh, that are embedded within various companies doing application security assessments within their companies, and they have static analysis tools. They'll have a, a Fortify SCA or a Checkmarks or, or other tools available to them and they, uh, they, they don't necessarily have an opportunity to run them because they never get the, uh, the source code. And my solution to this and what kind of prompted this talk is that um, even if we don't have source code, we should, still be, uh, we should still be running these tools on the information that we have. So my uh, solution is to try to utilize um, all the client side files that we have in performing a web assessment, all the JavaScript files that we can see, all the uh, HTML and all the other stuff that, uh, that's returned back from the browser, all the stuff that we get from various HTTP responses, uh, we, we, should, we should find a way to uh, run our, our static source code tools um, over these files. And I've had a, a lot of success and just, just, even when I don't have complete source code, I don't have all the code behind, and just analyzing HTML files and JavaScript files and, and running various, uh, running those through various static techniques, I find that I'm kind of introduced into a whole new class of volumes and, uh, and find a, a whole bunch of more, a whole bunch more vulnerabilities than I otherwise would. So I was brainstorming with uh, one of my colleagues, um, actually about a year ago, we were at um, a conference, it wasn't AppSec um, USA in, in New York last year, but a conference around that time, and we were kind of talking about this, um, and, um, we eventually uh, developed a little tool to, to help us reach a point where we could run static analysis tools um, during a web assessment. So we, uh, and that, that's kind of the bulk of this talk here. I'm going to talk about um, various static techniques that dynamic web assessors can use um, a, as they're performing as assessments. So my, my colleague, uh, Sam Denard and myself, were brainstorming and we're like, well, in order to, to, to run a, a lot of our static tools, we have to get all those JavaScript files and HTML files onto our testing machine. Um, we can do that as we manually uh, browse applications. We can go out to all these JavaScript files. We can right click, do a save as, and save them. But that takes, uh, that takes a lot of time. So we looked at several uh, tools that, uh, that will suck down sites. In fact, one of the tools we analyzed was a, a tool called Site Sucker for, uh, or a Mac OS, and it does exactly that. You give it a URL, you click the site suck button, and it tries to crawl spider the site and, and suck down all the, all the various files that it sees and, and store them locally so you have kind of a local copy of the, of the application. So, but our, in our analysis of a lot of these tools, we never found a tool that um, adequately covered the, the, the sites that we were trying to crawl. For various reasons, we found uh, that the tools that have trouble uh, getting through various uh, authentication um, mechanisms, or even when they could authenticate to a site, they would have trouble um, uh, getting, getting kind of the, the depth that we wanted. Um, as we looked at uh, a couple test sites uh, and trying to utilize some of these off-the-shelf tools, we found that there were very few that were adequately crawling what we had. So we decided to uh, take a different approach and try to utilize some of the information that we al already had available to us. So. Uh, a common tool that a lot of dynamic web testers use, uh, probably most of you in this room use, is, is the BERT proxy suite. So we tried to find a way to, um, as we're navigating an application, um, you know, we're, we're already, as dynamic testers, walking the site within BERT. We tried to find a way to take all those responses in BERT and then save those responses down as local files. So we developed a little tool, I'll demo it here in a, in a minute, um, called RIPSA. And RIPSA is an acronym that stands for uh, Response Interpretation in Preparation for Static Analysis. And I know that's a mouthful, and it'll probably make a lot more sense as I walk through what the tool does. Um, in short, it um, takes all your, all, all your responses from BURP, um, parses through them, and creates, uh, creates files on your local machine that you can then utilize, um, that, that you can then further test through various static techniques. Through running, 
various source code analyzers over them are doing uh, other types of manual techniques or scripts. So yeah, this is a you know, quick screenshot of the RIPSA tool. I'll run through it in a minute. Um, it, in short, it, it accepts an XML input from, from Burp, and that XML input is, that XML file is really easy to generate within Burp. You can right-click within your proxy history or right-click within your site tree and just do save selected items as XML, and it'll save the selected items. So from the dynamic web testing point of view, this, th this was easy. This was, really wasn't an extra step. We already had our site tree within Burp. We could just right-click and save. Um, so it, yeah, generating that XML file, super simple. Uh, the next thing that uh, the RIPSA tool does, it takes that XML input and it you know, parses through it. I'll show you a, a sample XML file here in a moment. You'll see it has all that response data and it, it creates, creates files on the local machine. And then once you have those files on, on your testing machine, uh, you can then utilize you know, whatever type of um, other static tools you might have or static techniques to, to analyze them. So I'll breeze through a couple of these screenshots real quick because I'm going to, uh, to walk through a demo. Um, this is just saving uh, XML file in Burp. Said it's you know, just as simple as right-clicking and hitting the Save as XML, uh, Save as XML button. And then the RIPSA tool analyze that XML file and and dump, the, parse through the XML and create create local files on your machine. We are creating them, um, we're grouping them by file type, and I'll tell you why in a, in a few minutes. And then once they're on your local machine, you can use you know, whatever types of tools or other techniques to, to analyze them. Um, obviously, being HP, I like, like to use Fortify SCA. Cool. Now, I'll run through a, kind of a quick demo. And I don't trust the demo gods at a big conference, so I kind of pre-recorded a quick video, um, to ho hopefully to ensure that this will go smoothly. So, in, the session I'll you know, kind of quickly walk through using the RIPSA tool and, and how I think it's useful. So the first step in utilizing the tool is, uh, is to, to gather a bunch of traffic um, in your... So here I picked a test site to analyze. I uh, thought the AppSec site would be, would, would be uh, an appropriate target. Uh, you can see based on the countdown here, I kind of waited to the last minute to create this, uh, create this video. Nothing like uh, procrastinating to the last minute. Uh, but here I'm, I'm walking the site and I have, uh, have Burp capturing all my traffic. And after I fully walk the site, hit all the pages and resources that I want to, um, uh, I'll, I'll then have all that information within my proxy tool. So within, within Burp, you can see I've you know, navigated the AppSec USA site. I've uh, you know, found a lot of interesting files, a lot of um, JavaScript files, a lot of um, other types of files. I also went back and hit some of the other subdomains, like some of the 2013 information. Uh, I can just highlight all, uh, I, then within Burp, I can just highlight all that I want to, uh, all that I want to copy and do a save as XML. And you can see here, you can do this both from the proxy history or from the site tree. I'm doing it from the site tree, um, just because I find that a little bit easier. And you can see that I have my site tree kind of narrowed down to only the items that um, were within the scope that I defined. Um, you could further add additional filters if there were just particular file types that you were after or particular other information that you were after. Uh, you, could, you could further utilize Burp's filters to j just save the items that you want. And this save, I think it takes like 90 seconds here to save, which is going to seem like 90 minutes. Um, and it, it's going to take a long, obviously the, uh, the duration of, uh, of the save is dependent on how many files you crawl and, and, and how big those responses are. Um, part of my crawling, I crawled through all the 2013 presentations, so all those PowerPoint files were, um, each of those were a couple megabytes, so I think that made that, this uh, save process a little bit longer. But eventually I'll have an XML file that I'll save off to my desktop, and then we can use that XML file to do other interesting things. Cool, and while, we, while I wait for the save here real quick, I'll just quickly you, uh, mention, you probably noticed that rips a tool as, uh, was, was a Windows application, and my colleague Sam and I developed it in .NET purely because we're most familiar with .NET and we were able to, um, to, to code it very quickly. We already knew how to, to parse XML. Um, obviously, uh, 
I have a kind of a call out to the community later. We'd be very interested in, uh, in seeing what you guys think if it'd be a useful burp uh, extension or maybe something that we could add to Zap. Cool, we can take a quick look at the XML file that was saved. Um, see, it's just a straightforward XML file. For each request, we've got a URL, some other uh, interesting uh, metadata, and then it has the response data, which is what we're, uh, which is what we're truly after. And let me pause this real quick. Um, you can see in the XML elements, one of the things that is, is extremely useful to us is in, in the, the way that Burp is storing the data, it has, a, it has a XML tag for extension, um, which was ex extremely useful as we didn't have to analyze the, uh, the URL or parse or you know, uh, you know, truncate the URL query to, to figure out what type of file it was. So you could basically take the response, take the whatever type of extension it is, and just write it out as a file. So now I'll demonstrate kind of doing that with this uh, RIPSA utility. And as, as I just mentioned, RIPSA is a Windows utility, purely because that's what we were able to code and develop very quickly. Um, the RIPSA utility has a, has a little uh, configuration file that enables the user, user to set a couple defaults. You can set the default uh, input folder, input output folder, and uh, a couple other defaults as well. Um, using the tool is, is really quite easy. There's really just, um, really just a, a, a couple of data elements you provide an, an XML file as, a, as an input. So here we'll select the XML file that we saved off from Burp that has our site tree. We'll select, we'll select an output directory, the uh, folder where we want to write out all the, all the files that we create. Um, and then there's an option here for uh, basically to scan. And we can, there's, you probably notice there's a little text box here where we can specify exactly what file types uh, to write out and I click the checkbox just to write out all file types. You can see I set the output directory to my C temp out, and I navigated out to that directory just so you could see that that directory is empty. And then when I hit the scan button, that directory magically fills up with all the files that, uh, that we're writing out from Burp. And once I get those files on my, uh, my local machine, I can, I, I, I can really do a whole lot more analysis with them. Um, I can run you know, various static, analysis tools over them, or I can um, manually inspect them for sensitive data. I can do various strings analysis. Um, really, the, there, there's a lot more possibilities once I get all this data onto my machine. So you can kind of quickly see that just kind of walking through a website, I pull down all the JavaScript files, uh, pull down all the HTML files, have them grouped to get you know, the PD, all the PDF files from the, from the AppSec site, um, and as well as all the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, you know, files from last year. So in addition to security analysis, it's yeah, just also a useful tool just for harvesting a lot of information very quickly. And as, as I mentioned, one of the reasons that we decided to save these files off into uh, their, their file types and saving them off into a PDF directory and an HTML directory, is just so we can do different types of um, group, those in, group those different directories into uh, different types of analysis. Um, we decided against kind of saving them as the as the website structure. Now, it's, you know, purely for when we had you know a whole bunch of DLL files, we could then take that DLL directory and uh, you know quickly send it to some automated process to to decompile them and do something else with them. Or if we had a, a big directory of all the PDF files from from a site, we could zip those up and send them to a customer and say, hey, did you really know that all these you know 300 PDF files were on your site and uh, some of them look like they contain some sensitive information. Cool, so the next part of this demo, this is um, just a slightly different version of the, of the RIPSA tool. Um, this version uh, is a version I'm using uh, internally for, for some of my assessments, and it has a couple extra buttons you can see at the bottom. And those extra buttons um, enable me to um, auto automatically kick off uh, Fortify SCA and, and run some uh, uh, and try to automate some of my static analysis. Uh, it'd be you know, very easy to do the same type of things with other static analysis tools as well. So this part of the demo, walking, walking through really the, the same steps, uh, saving, the, go, parsing through that same appsec.xml file, writing all those same files out, uh, writing all those same files out to my, to my directory, and then I can run some uh, more static analysis over them. 
Cool. Uh, actually, let me back up just a second. This might happen really fast, but just wanted to show those kind of two buttons at the bottom. Is, you know, something that uh, I, I use internally to kind of kind of script out uh, some of my auto automated testing. So it you know, becomes very easy to uh, pull down all these files and then uh, automatically kick off uh, a, you know, a Fortify SCA scan. You could do the uh, similar technique if you were using check marks or um, FXCOP or you know, some, some other uh, static utilities as well. So here I'm walking through the um, HP uh, Fortify SCA wizard, just kind of selecting all the defaults and throwing it at my output directory to saying, hey, take that, out, that, that temp slash output directory and see what you can scan over there. And then once I get s some of those defaults set up, I'll just hit the, the run scan button. And you'll see this will start running a, a, a source code analysis scan uh, in the background. And while it runs that uh, source code analysis scan, I'm going to open up a couple other files just so you can see that this really does uh, pull down all the files based on that response data. We're stripping out the HTTP header information and then, then writing these files out. Um, but you can see um, th through this analysis, I, I was able to grab all those 2013 presentations. In fact, this is one of the presentations my, one of my colleagues did at AppSec USA last year. And just through my manual kind of wa walking the site and running the RIPSA tool uh, against that XML file, I was able to, yeah, I, I now have a collection of all the all, all the presentation files from, from AppSec last year as well as some of the information from this year like that um, AppSec temp, uh, PowerPoint template. Um, yeah, quickly on the, sc the screen, you can probably see a couple of the other file types out there. I have, you know, a bunch of PHP files, a bunch of HTML files. Um, I find that grouping these files is um, especially useful for running uh, strings analysis um, on, on Word documents, PDF documents, as well as PowerPoint documents searching for strings that might be, might be sensitive to a customer. So this is another uh, little utility I've written. This is out on my, uh, uh, the source code for that is out on my, uh, my, my GitHub repository. It basically does kind of the, uh, d just some basic strings uh, analysis. We can provide this, uh, this tool a, a file, uh, give it a string to search for, and it'll say whether it can find the, uh, f find the given string within, within the file. So I'm going to pick on that presentation that one of my colleagues did last year on iOS hacking, and I'll search for a couple strings. You can see when I searched for ASDF, it didn't return any results, but when I searched for the string Apple, it came back with two results. Um, and not, not surprising that it found the term Apple within that presentation as it was an iOS presentation. And if I search for the term HP, you can see it comes back with all kinds of, kinds of results as he's probably using a bunch of HP, uh, HP logos and HP templates. Um, but you know, even that, that that technique, we can you know quickly um, analyze files and search for uh, data elements that might be sensitive to a particular customer. So if we know of a particular string that might be sensitive um, for a various assessment, whether that be a password or some other type of, of of sensitive string, we can do some we can do some really quick analysis. So my SCA scan is still running here in the background. Um, it's at 20%, and don't fret because I think I. Fast forward the video here so we can quickly jump to some of the results. Awesome, right on cue. And you can see now we're at you know, 90, 92% complete. We're just about uh, ready to, to get the results from that automated scan. You can see, uh, see it's starting to dump the, the output results here uh, to my machine, and then I'll be able to open up that results file and look at some of the things that the, uh, that the source code analyzer um, automatically found. Now, say the AppSec USA uh, website you know, wasn't the most interesting site from a vulnerability perspective. It's you know, mostly static content, um, so, so uh, you know, not necessarily the most uh, interesting site to look at for vulnerability information, but as a proof of concept, you can see that this is kind of really easy to do. If we can, we're already a, as web testers navigating sites. If we have a way to pull down all the files that we're analyzing, we can then run other types of interesting analysis on it and get a lot of uh, results really quickly. So open up some of the uh, you know, quick results that I found from this AppSec research. And um, I'll just say it didn't find anything uh, particularly alarming. Um, it found a, you know, a whole bunch of 
uh, insecure randomness, a whole bunch of instances of JavaScript files that were using the math.random function. Uh, I think they found a couple uh, hard-coded passwords, which I think uh, were actually just kind of the, uh, which were actually, I think, just in comments, but weren't really passwords. It noticed one of the login forms on the website um, had autocomplete enabled on its password field. But you can just kind of quickly see it's kind of a proof of concept. It's um, really easy to do a, a whole lot of quick analysis. And cool, I think I have a question. Awesome. So the, the question was, what are some of the examples of real-world um, vulnerabilities that I'm finding through this technique? And the area that I find, uh, I've found this to be the most beneficial is in doing various JavaScript analysis, and in particular in finding DOM-based cross-site scripting. I find, you know, a lot of the dynamic assessment tools are still not really good at automatically finding DOM-based cross-site scripting. A lot of the static tools seem to be a lot better at finding DOM-based cross-site scripting. Um, they sometimes over-report those types of things, but it at least uh, gives me um, at least gives me a target as I uh, as I start to as I'm analyzing an application. Um, I'll go over a, a couple other examples here in a minute as I kind of kind of kind of wrap this up. So I think this tool is uh, uh, yeah helping me in a lot of ways. It's helping me win a lot of assessments um, by reducing potential false negatives. It's giving me more coverage introducing kind of a, a, uh, more, a, more of an attack surface, uh, an attack surface of, of files that I previously wasn't analyzing as thoroughly as, uh, as maybe I should have been. Uh, it's also um, utilizing information that I already have available. So by using, by using the, the burp suite, I'm not really going through any extra steps. I'm already, as a web tester, uh, walking the site with my proxy tool. Or, so I'm already collecting all this information. I just found a way to um, kind of automatically bring those files down to my local machine. And then I went in by kind of pairing my dynamic assessment with portions of a static assessment. Find if you, you, know, you, you run your static tools just over those presentation layer find, uh, files, you know, all those HTML, JavaScript files, you might find things that a lot of your dynamic tools aren't finding. Um, so once you have those files, you know, on your on your local machine, you can run you know any static tools. You can run check marks. You can run Fortify SCA. You can use FXCOP, which you know might be more of a quality tool, but I find it's also interesting for security analysis. You can run you know JS Hint on your uh, on your on your JavaScript files. You can do you know, any, any of your manual techniques, manually inspecting files or manual scripts. Um, and as as I mentioned just just a moment ago, it's helped me a lot in finding DOM-based cross-site scripting and doing a deeper dive into JavaScript analysis. And another area that it's really helped me is in Silverlight analysis. Um, because they're probably already, as you analyze Silverlight um, applications, you know, navigating out to all those Silverlight files, downloading them and disassembling them. But I found that um, using this tool helped me automate that process. Instead of having to nat uh, manually type in all the XAP um, a URLs for a, for a Silverlight application, I could just use the, use the application as normal. And my browser would find all those XAP files. I could use the RIPSA tool, then download them to my local machine. And once I had all those Silverlight files on my local machine, I could you, know, you run a script to disassemble them, or unzip them, then disassemble them, and, and analyze them further. So I found that it's been really helpful for, uh, for Silverlight um, analysis, you know, as well as you know, other kind of DLLs and, and going over uh, other types of files like PDFs um, that, that you might not think of as being overly sensitive but often contain sensitive strings. So a couple, uh, a couple takeaways. Um, I, I'd encourage all of the dynamic testers here to embrace static. I know it's a, kind of a, a scary world, um, but there's, you know, I find a lot of dynamic testers have access to static tools and they're just not utilizing them. And they don't utilize them because they don't necessarily have source code to run over them. But I'm here uh, today telling you, you don't necessarily have source code. You do have access to a lot of presentation layer files, um, a lot of JavaScript files, and other types of files that are interesting that a lot of the static tools can, um, can, can analyze for you and, uh, and, and bring back very interesting information. Also, it's kind of a, just a general takeaway. I encourage the dynamic folks to kind of embrace static results as a way of um, helping with content discovery. 
I love it when I can get um, static results before I start a test because it helps me really identify the targets that I'm going to go after. Instead of having to guess what files might exist out on a website, I'm able to get, kind of go over the static results and see, well, these are exactly what files exist for this, th this application, and it helps a lot with the content discovery. So as I'm running out of time, uh, I just have a quick call out to the community. Um, as I mentioned, I've been uh, attending OWASP meetings for the last seven years, and OWASP has been just a, a fantastic organization, both in getting information out and as well as a sounding board for just um, bouncing ideas off various colleagues. So I'd, um, a call out to you guys for just ideas on whether you think I, I'm nuts, maybe this uh, technique just doesn't make any sense, or maybe some of you guys find this useful and have other ideas on how we could extend this. Um, I quickly used Burp because it's a tool I was more familiar with than Zap, and I also found that uh, yeah, Burp had that saved XML that had all the information I already needed into it. But maybe there's an opportunity to create a Zap extension or, or find a way to, to have Zap um, you know, auto automatically uh, suck down your site and, and save files locally for you. Um, so I'm open to ideas. I'll be hanging around uh, the rest of the day, and tomorrow I'll be around the HP booth quite a bit. Would encourage you guys to stop by and uh, stop by and chat. Um, before I wrap up, I want to give a, a special shout out to a couple folks that uh, helped with this project and encouraged me to get up on stage here today. Uh, most notably, Sam Denard, who is kind of my, my right hand man in in developing the Squiddle Ripsa tool. Um, yeah, Sam was kind of my sounding board for for figuring this all out, and uh, just a just a tremendous uh, tremendous resource. And then I want to give a special thanks to David Nestor and Mark Pfefferman. Mark is here with the Denim Group here today. He's hanging around the Denim Group booth. And both David and Mark encouraged me to speak, and in fact, I think David may have submitted this abstract uh, for me. So uh, appreciate uh, their encouragement and getting me involved and, and getting me up on stage here today. And also, just like to mention, I. 95% sure that that first OWASP meeting I attended you know, way back in June in 2007, that Sam, David, and Mark were all at that meeting. So OWASP is a, is a community. It's a, you know, it's a sounding board. It's a, a community where we need to uh, continue to encourage each other and bounce ideas off of each other. So I'd love to chat with some, some of you throughout the conference and, 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 and get your uh, feedback and ideas. So finally, if you want to reach out to me, um, I know you probably won't remember my name after this session, but you might remember my email alias. I'm hacker at hp.com. But that's easy to remember. If you, if you email me, you'll find a way to make this tool available if you're interested. Um, my, uh, I'll talk with the uh, AppSec USA organizer, see if there's a way I can post it, and uh, would love to hear from you. Great. Thanks for your time.